So in the book of Mark, we are coming a, a, um, we're coming up to a really cool story. We're coming up to a story where a blind man received his vision. Everybody say vision. Now, if you all have been here for a couple months where we've been studying Mark, what we're going to see is that this is actually the second time in this book where a blind man receives sight. This isn't the first time that this has happened in the book of Mark. What's interesting here is the way that the book of Mark is sort of organized, the, the time when Jesus... Um, and we're going to read it here in a second. The time when Jesus healed the man, he put the mud on his eyes and he received sight. These kind of stories of people who are blind receiving their sight is sort of the book ends to a whole bunch of miracles that Jesus does. So Mark kind of organizes this book. He tells this story and then of a blind man receiving sight and then pow, 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 pow. You know, there's like 30 stories of Jesus doing some crazy stuff bunch of miracles, teaching, parables, and then the passage that we're coming to today is sort of the bookend of a whole bunch of cool things that Jesus does. And it sort of ends this little section in Mark, because right after this, we start heading towards Palm Sunday and all of the, uh, you know, and, and the death and resurrection of Jesus. So we're coming to the end in the book of Mark of like all of these miracles and stuff that Jesus does. Mark bookends it with these images of blind people receiving sight. And I think what's, what's really important here to recognize is that for one, this isn't done by accident. Like these stories in these books are organized in particular ways. And it's important for us as people who are longing to develop our faith, to become more like Jesus, to hold this reality that the scriptures are dynamic. That one story can mean a myriad of things that there's a lot of stuff that's going on in how the books are structured and the stories that are told and who is impacted, that there is a lot going on. So when we read this passage about a blind guy receiving sight, yes, it's about the miracle. It definitely is about this blind person receiving sight. But it's also about some other things too. Like, for example, there were people around that saw this happen This story impacted them as well. You know, there's family members or friends of the people who receive sight. If you remember in the first one, there were the the blind man, his friends brought him to Jesus. Like they were there. It was also their act of faith. So yes, that guy did receive his sight and that's a blessing, but there was also people around him who were impacted, right? So it's not just about the physical miracle. I'm not taking away from the physical miracle. Like that's super awesome. But there's also other things that go on. It's dynamic, right? In a story, there's always different views, different perspectives. And so what I'm asking for us is to hold, be a little open-handed to see the dynamic nature of the scriptures and especially this story. And why is this important? Because the spiritual impacts of stories like this impact us all in a deep way. This story along with all others in the scriptures, are inviting each and every one of us into something beautiful. All of the scriptures are calling us to be formed in some kind of way. Yes, it is about this guy getting healed, but it's also about what is God inviting us into? How is he molding us? How is this impacting me? God is always inviting us to be formed in deeper ways, always. So yes, we wanna learn about miracles, and we'll talk about that, don't you worry. But the posture here is saying that it could be dynamic enough that God is also inviting me into something, even if I'm not like blind in my vision. Maybe I am blind in my vision. God is always inviting us to be formed into deeper ways like Jesus. And I think this is really important. Because for many of us, especially when we have things going on inside, things we're ashamed of especially, things that we don't want to tell anybody else, things we're embarrassed about, there's a temptation for us to take the gospel, to take the things that Jesus teaches, to take the things that the scripture teaches and just project it out on everybody else to focus on the world and everything that's happening outside of me so that I don't have to focus on what's going on 
inside of me. And so when we hear a lot of stuff, when we get really excited about particular things in the scriptures, so often we project it out and we talk about them and what they're doing and why they don't see right, when really we're just scared of identifying what's going on inside of us. And so we obsess with the outside without ever taking time to ask what's going on in the inside. We're concerned if the world is not seeing right or if they are seeing right without taking the time to consider if we are seeing right. In Matthew chapter seven, it says, first take the plank out of your own eye and you will see clearly to remove the speck from your neighbor's eye. We have to look at our own self first. And so yes, when we read the scriptures, there is implications on what's going on in the world. I'm not suggesting that. But the first question we must ask is, what is God inviting me into through this story? In what ways is God inviting me to see in a new way? I think what happens so often for us, and this is really similar to what Dr. E was hinting at earlier, is so often we, we, we think we're fighting for something just, but we're actually fighting for it, fighting for it in an unjust way because we've not asked how God is forming us through this situation. And all throughout the scriptures, God is doing incredible things and we see how the incredible things he's doing is forming the individuals outside of the miracles, outside of the big stories. For example, when God would do miracles, it was always in, uh, there was always a result of disciples being formed, okay? Being changed, being molded, being, being um, yeah, formed to be more like Jesus. So like, let's, let's think about this right here, right? So in the first time Jesus heals a blind man, this is in Mark chapter eight. It says, they came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch them. He took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked, can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people. They look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he looked and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. And that miracle is wildly beautiful, is it not? But you know what's really interesting is what happened to Peter after that miracle. You see, what happened to Peter is that his spiritual eyes were opened as well. Right after that miracle in the scriptures, Jesus says, do you know who I am? And Peter finally recognizes, you are the Messiah. You see, it was right following that miracle that something had formed in Peter, in his spiritual life, where the veil was lifted and he saw Jesus for who he was. There was many things going on. And then we see for Peter, though, there's so much more that he had to awaken to. Not just that Jesus was the Messiah, but then Peter, through all of these things that he watched this happen with Jesus, Peter has to learn that, like, you have to, like, give up your life to lose it. He, he learns about sacrifice. He, he sees Jesus, right? Like, 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 head towards the cross. Peter didn't understand everything that was going on. He still had to spiritually awaken to so much. And he had spent some time, you know, he was around, So not only was Jesus healing people out here, but he was forming the disciples to look more like him. And so again, the same can be said for us. There's a lot of beautiful things that happen in this church. There's a lot of beautiful things that happen around in our lives. People get sober, people working to find freedom, giving up their addictions. There's so many beautiful miracles and sometimes we also look out here, but again, what is God doing inside of us? What is he inviting us into? And so through today's scripture, we're going to read the other side, the, the, the second time in the book of Mark where God gives sight to a blind man. But what we see here is that this particular story is not just about a blind man receiving sight, but this is a master class. I'm telling you, it is a master class in teaching us how our spiritual eyes can be reawakened. And some of us are coming in here just simply confused. Our spiritual lives feel dry. 
We feel so far from God. We feel so far from sobriety. We feel so far from the Father. We're just like, how the heck can I just even feel anything? Like, yeah, that worship was loud and cool, and some people, like, but I didn't feel none of that. <laughs> and I get that. I've been there. I feel that. And after all, is this not what the whole sermon series has been about? Holy dust. What does it look like for us to be formed by Jesus? To become more like him, to open our eyes to the ways in which he actually lives and moves and breathes. And how does that form how we move and live and breathe? So in Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52... says this. And then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, get on your feet. He is calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. What a peculiar question. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. So Jesus says, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. So the question, as I mentioned in the beginning of this sermon, is how does this form us? How does this form me? How may my blind eyes be opened as well? What does this have to teach me about that? Here's something that is just so fun to me, and some of you nerds might think this is awesome, and some of you other might just think this is a waste of time, but check this out. The first time Jesus healed the blind man, they were in Bethsaida, which is 212 meters below sea level. And then after that miracle, and then you read from that point on, they go to, and I can't even all pronounce all these, I'm not that smart, but like Cascaria, which is 25 meters above sea level. Then in the scriptures, the next town, Philippi, which is um, 442 meters above sea level. Then they go back down to 200 meters below Galilee, but that's not lower than Bethsaida. Capernaum is 207. Then they go to Judea, 298. Okay, so they started really low the first time somebody gets healed. It's really low in elevation. Then they kind of go up, they take a little dip, but, but, but the first town was lower. And then Judea is way up here. And then Jericho, where the second time a blind person was healed, negative 240 meters below sea level. So the first time Jesus heals a blind man, way, way, way low. And then they kind of go on this journey, and then at the bookend, right before all the Holy Week stuff happens, another time where a blind man receives sight way, way below sea level. But what's so interesting here is that these blind people that were healed, not only were they geographically in a really low place, they were in a really low place of society as well. They were poor, they were beggars, They needed other people to help them. Could it be that our blind eyes are opened when we are at the lowest point? Could it be that when we are at our lowest point is when our spiritual eyes are opened? When we are humble? When we have lost everything? You know, I... When, when, when there's people that carry around a major arrogance about them, as if they just know everything, I tend to not trust those people. The people who just have every single friggin' answer to every single problem that everybody has. <laughs> You're like, you've not lived real life. Like, I don't trust you. <laughs> but it's the person that says, like, no, like, I've been to the bottom 
They've been humbled. They've been to the lowest point. I trust that person, the, pus- the person who saw something at the lowest point, the person who had lost everything and somehow found God in it, that's the person I want to learn from. And if it can happen to those people, it can happen to me too. That when I'm at the lowest point, when I'm at my sickest, when, I'm, when I am the most high, when I've lost everything, that maybe at the lowest point, my spiritual eyes can be opened too. And so this, you know, and, and here's what's so interesting, right? So often we try, to, we try to gain power and prestige and wealth in order to influence the kingdom. You know, we think, well, if I just have this kind of power through owning this business or having this much money or this political person or that political person, and it's like Jesus did none of that. <laughs> like, like that wasn't how he changed the world or brought a spiritual awakening. It was not through getting any type of major power. He didn't try to become Caesar. He did the exact opposite. The exact opposite. He went to the lowest because he knew at the lowest point, the one who is serving the poor, the one who is around the prostitutes, the one who is with the left out, the marginalized, he associated himself with them because that's where spiritual eyes are opened, on the margins, at the lowest point. We have to humble ourselves, give up this rat race trying to chase the top of the ladder, sell everything, give it to the poor. This is where our spiritual eyes are opened. We must go there. The second thing I noticed in the story is that blind eyes are opened when we wait and listen. You see, Bartimaeus, he was sitting by the roadside and he heard He was just sitting there. He was waiting. You know, perhaps many of us have been unable to have our spiritual awakening. We've been been unable to see Jesus in our life because we've been so busy running and chasing him. When if maybe we just sat down for a minute, we might see him walk right on by. Could it be that we're running so hard after God that we've ran right past him? That like for so many of us, we don't take time for silence to just sit and wait. To simply listen and hear God, listening for when he, he didn't see God walk by, he heard God walk by. He didn't have a podcast in his ears. He wasn't arguing with somebody. He wasn't trying to prove a point. He wasn't trying to win anything. He was listening. He heard Jesus walk by. We are too busy. We don't Sabbath. We don't rest our minds. We don't rest our spirits. We don't rest our ears. For so many of us, if we just took a few minutes and a few deep breaths, we may just hear Jesus walking right by us. After all, was it not Jesus who often removed himself from a situation to just go sit in a garden somewhere? This is what it looks like to follow Jesus to create margin and space to sit and be quiet and to listen. Because here's what's interesting is that we don't need to chase God. So many of us are so tired because we've been working so hard to chase him, trying to prove our worth, trying to prove our ability to get to him, trying to... But in Christmas, like like the Christmas narrative, like he came to us. Like he came here. He entered into our environment. He came after us. In John 14, one of my favorite scriptures, he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will come to you. Thirdly, I believe our blind eyes are opened when we ask for what we need. 
it's peculiar to me that Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Like, didn't he know? I thought he was Jesus. <laughs> but there's a couple implications here that I think are deeply important. First of all, Jesus cares about what you specifically need. He wants to ask. He cares about us. He wants a dialogue. He wants a talk. He wants to know us. He wants us to know him. What do you specifically need? Have you specifically asked for that thing? Maybe, just maybe, Jesus cares about you specifically. But many of us don't believe it, so we haven't risked it to ask a specific thing. And perhaps today is a moment in time where we can say, you know what, Lord? I really need this. Maybe he cares for us that much. But what else is interesting here is that Bartimaeus knew exactly what to ask for. And you might think, well, of course he asked for his sight. He was blind. He was also a beggar. He could have asked for money. He could have asked for a job. He could have asked for community. Like, remember the last blind sight story? People brought that guy to Jesus. Bartimaeus didn't have any people to bring him. He was just sitting there. He was alone all by himself. Maybe he would have asked for community. He could have asked for a home. Most people believe he was homeless. Like beggars usually just begged and slept in the same place. He could have asked for social status. He could have, he could have asked Jesus for anything. There were many things that he could have asked for, actually. But he asked instead for sight. What if we've been asking for the wrong things all along? We've been asking for this thing or that thing to happen when really what we need is our blind eyes to be opened. We've been asking for a big change in society. We've been asking for all this because we're so miserable because when we watch the news, it makes us so miserable. And we're asking for this to change and that to change and my spouse to change and for this person to change and my kid to change and, all, and my boss to change, all of these things when really it's like, maybe I just need a new vision. Maybe it's me first. Maybe we've been asking for the wrong things. Sure, we may be asking for sobriety, but deep down is the real thing that we need healing for our loneliness, to heal our relationships with our parents, the shame we feel for whatever we did. Sure, we may be asking for physical healing, but is there emotional trauma in our life that's actually manifesting itself in our body? Are we actually asking for the right thing? But here, here's what's so interesting. In Mark chapter 8, earlier on, right before the miracle of the loaves to bread, Jesus says, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or do you not yet understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes to see or do you have ears? Do you have eyes and don't see? Do you have ears and don't hear? Bartimaeus had ears to hear. But he was waiting and heard Jesus. He knew he needed eyes to see. And so this brings me to the point, how do we know what to ask for? Like Bartimaeus knew what to ask for. Well, first, we sit and wait. We must create margin in our life to sit and wait, to be honest about what's going on. At some point, we have to be honest about our pain. Before Jesus went into ministry, what did he do? He went through the wilderness. Before Jesus went onto the cross, he had to go through a whole painful journey before he got there, before there was resurrection. The journey to resurrection in our life, we must go through seasons of waiting, seasons of struggle, seasons of pain. This is always the cycles of how it's worked forever. We must be honest. 
We sit and we wait. We go through the hard stuff. Resurrection can't happen if death doesn't happen first. But secondly, we ask a lot. How do we know what to ask for when Jesus walks in front of us like Bartimaeus did? We ask a lot. You know what's interesting about Bartimaeus? He was a beggar. His entire livelihood was based on asking. Every day he asked and he asked and he asked and he asked and he asked. This was the narrative of his entire life. He was humble, he was at his lowest point, but he was not too prideful to think he could figure it out on his own. He wasn't trying to do it himself. He was asking for help the whole friggin' time. He already knew how to be humble and ask for help. Remember when our blind eyes are open? When we're at the lowest point, we have to be willing to ask for help. He was an expert in asking for help. Our blind eyes are never opened all by ourselves. It was after a lifetime of waiting and asking for help that Jesus finally walked by and he knew to ask. So what is the thing we need asking for? Have we actually asked for it? I'm I'm trying to remember where the scripture is, but it says in the scriptures, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given unto you. I think it's a TMS verse. Sorry, it's a navigator thing. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, what does that mean? It means meditation, it means sitting, it means waiting, it means thinking upon the scripture. Not if you talk a lot about me and you go on social media a lot about me, then ask whatever you wish and it will be given. No, you sit and you wait and you marinate. You spend time in silence. You listen, then ask whatever you wish because you're gonna know exactly what you need. You're going to know. So the call today is to be like Bartimaeus, to humble ourselves, to ask for help. We're not going to make it. Like Jesus in this story, he was teaching us how to see like Bartimaeus got sight. And there still are parts of us somewhere It may be physical, it may be emotional, it may be spiritual. All of that is welcome here. But we must create the space to listen and to ask. You have not because you ask not, but do you even know that you need to ask? And the reason this is so important is because Jesus specifically asked him. And why did Jesus specifically ask him? Because he loved him so deeply. You don't ask a specific question to someone unless you really know them and really care about them. And maybe you came today feeling like Jesus doesn't know your name. And so maybe today is the time to risk it. To say, I'm gonna trust that Jesus is saying, insert name here, what do you want? And it might just be the time to risk it, to trust that he cares about you specifically, your, to your DNA. Take a risk and answer. Take a risk that he might be speaking directly to you. So we're gonna create some space as we, as, we wrap this, as we wrap this up here. And just for a few more minutes, I know it's been a, a, a long morning and, and we might have a, a touch of music, but just to put our, our hearts before the Lord, to practice what might it look like to be silent for a few minutes 
to ask specifically, to trust that Jesus is here saying, Tyler, see, Zaria, what do you need? Eric, what do you need? So Jesus, I pray that you would come near, that you would slow us all down. Jesus, Jesus. And that in this moment of stillness and slowest, that you would walk through these rows right in front of us. And that we would let go of our concerns of the people to our left and to the right and the people on TV, and we would ask, God, what are you inviting me into in this moment? Lord, would you open our eyes? Would you open our eyes to see a father who loves us deeply? Lord, would you open our eyes so we could see you with open arms? It took the prodigal son a long time for his eyes to be opened. And it was when he was at his lowest point that he finally ran home to his father. And the father sat there with arms wide open, ready to receive his son, ready to receive his daughter. There were no 30 days of sobriety. (laughs) There were no big apology meetings. That would all happen in the fullness of time. But in that moment, the father was simply there to embrace his child. It was not a fix it before you get it. He simply, the son simply opened his eyes and his father was there. No questions asked. My son, my daughter, what do you need? We may be at our lowest point and that is exactly where our blind eyes get open. There is no shame for being at your lowest point. There is no shame. So Father God, I pray that you would meet your children here tonight. That for all of us, you would bless us and keep us. You would make your face to shine upon us. Be oh so gracious and show us peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to a message from the Sanctuary Church. For more information and media, go to our website at thesanctuarywestside.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube.